My name is Jamie Cope. I am the Manager of Business Development at the WVU Industrial Extension. And again, we're happy to have you here. Uh, we're gonna do a great presentation here with uh, Mr. Greg Green, who is fairly new to our group, but uh, extremely knowledgeable. He'll get into a little bit of his background here in a little bit. But uh, we'd love to invite you to, to reach out to the, the Industrial Extension if you have any needs for, for safety, quality, lean, you name it. Um, Greg, could you go ahead and switch to that next slide real quick? Uh, we've got a lot of really great stuff going on, but I uh, wanted to make sure that everybody was aware that we offer 10 hour OSHA outreach training. And that's uh, something that, that we've, we've done for years, we're gonna continue to do. But one thing that, that has changed is uh, if, if we can get uh, an application um, if we, you can, you can apply to have this done by a, a video conferencing now that we've got uh, these, these COVID situation in place. So if there's something that you would like to, to look into with us, we'd love to have you uh, reach out to, to, to John Frazier with our group or Greg Green and they could give you more information or feel free to reach out to me as well. I'm going to put John's contact information in the chat so that you can reach out to him if you're interested and we'd love to help you out but you guys aren't here to listen to me talk you're one to listen to uh, Mr. Greg Green so Greg why don't you take it away all right with that said hello everyone <clears throat> my name is Greg Green I'm a safety and health specialist for West Virginia University's industrial extension service welcome to this live 30-minute webinar titled protecting employees from heat related illness this presentation is the first in a series of safety focused webinars being presented during the month of August. I would like to make you aware of some additional webinars that are currently scheduled. Along with today's protecting employees from heat related illness webinar in August, the West Virginia Industrial Extension will be presenting the following webinars. Next on August 19th, we'll be preparing for OSHA inspections, which will be followed by introduction to website globalization, with the U.S. Commerce Service on August 24th. Finally, Protecting Employees on the Road will be presented on August 26th. You will find a complete list of webinars and register for them at wvmep.com forward slash webinars. Each of these will begin at 11, unless otherwise noted, and they are all free of charge. Before we get started, I wanna address a few housekeeping items. At the end of the presentation, there will be a Q&A session. If you would like to submit a question, please use the chat box as we go. Finally, please make sure your devices are muted. <clears throat> Again, my name is Greg Green and I'm a safety and health specialist with the West Virginia University Industrial Extension. I have a master's degree in safety and environmental management from WVU and over 15 years of field experience with 12 years being a federal coal mine inspector with a mine safety and health administration. I previously worked with Kiwa Corporation and traveled around the country as a safety manager on various projects. <clears throat> the WVU Industrial Extension Team is part of a national network of manufacturing extension partnerships with each state having at least one center. As a smaller state, West Virginia has just one center, which is located in the Statler College of Engineering at WVU in Morgantown. Our team partners with small and medium sized manufacturers in West Virginia to support operational improvement and business growth. As part of West Virginia University, the group serves the university's land grant mission by functioning as a state industrial extension. As West Virginia's affiliate to the NIST MEP national network, we are part of a nationwide program of centers tasked with supporting the manufacturing community. This unique arrangement provides us the opportunity to support the manufacturing community from a national, state, and local level. The group focuses on developing consulting services that reflect client needs, provide hands-on education, and work one-on-one -on -one with our clients to deliver practical solutions in the areas of workforce, occupational health and safety, management systems, operational improvement, advanced manufacturing, leadership development, and innovation and growth services. The objective for this webinar is to help you identify heat related conditions, heat related illnesses, and ways to protect your employees from the heat. 
Although OSHA does not have any specific standards related to heat hazards, they can always rely on a general duty clause that states, each employer shall furnish to each of his employees a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or are likely to cause death or serious physical harm to his employees. Some of you are sitting there and thinking, can this really happen? Or is heat-related illnesses that dangerous? Here are a few examples of how serious heat-related illnesses can be. John Watzlawick missed five weeks after a knee surgery. When he returned in July, the heat was already so bad that two other postal workers in his area had been hospitalized a week earlier, one with renal failure. The temperature hit 104 on Watzlawick's first day back. He called his boss and asked if he could take a sick day. He was allegedly told to hydrate and finish the job. He returned to work the following day when the high hit 102. When Watzlawick called for an extra hand, his supervisor told him help would arrive later. At 2.50 p.m., he collapsed. Hospital staff recorded his core temperature at 108.7 before he died. James Baldessari collapsed on a day that the heat index hit 100 degrees. His core temperature had climbed to 110. OSHA files show higher up in Baldessari's area discussed heat dangers, but supervisors failed to convey the safety procedures to carriers. Supervisors received several heat advisories in the weeks before Baldessari's death. Carriers who were interviewed by OSHA said they were unaware of them. OSHA was involved in both of these cases and cited the general duty clause. One that hits closer to home is when first responders were called to John Marshall High School's football field in Glendale, West Virginia, after 37 band members became overwhelmed by heat. Several students started complaining of dizziness and nausea, with a few even throwing up. In all, 37 students were treated at three different area hospitals for heat exhaustion. The major issue was a mixture of the heat and the brand new field turf, which gets much hotter than grass on which the band usually practices. 16 area ambulances from West Virginia and Ohio had to be dispatched to help with triage. Thankfully, only one student was kept overnight for observation and was later released. In the previous decade, over 8,000 heat-related deaths were reported in the United States. In 72% of these deaths, the underlying cause was exposure to excessive heat, and heat was a contributing factor in the remaining 28%. Heat-related deaths were reported most frequently among males, and almost all heat-related deaths occurred during May through September, with the highest numbers reported during July and August. In recent years, excessive heat has caused more deaths than all other weather events, including floods. A heat wave is a prolonged period of excessive heat, generally 10 degrees or more above average, often combined with excessive humidity. You will likely hear weather forecasters use these following terms when a heat wave is predicted in your community. Excessive heat watch is when the conditions are favorable for an excessive heat event to meet or exceed local excessive heat warning criteria in the next 24 to 72 hours. Heat advisory is when the heat index values are forecasting to meet locally defined advisory criteria for one to two days with daytime highs from 100 to 105 degrees Fahrenheit. An excessive heat warning is when the heat index values are forecasting to meet or exceed locally defined warning criteria for at least two days, with daytime highs reaching 105 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Some general precautions to think about while we get started are to listen to local weather forecasts and stay aware of upcoming temperature changes. Be aware of both the temperature and the heat index. The heat index is the temperature the body feels when the effects of heat and humidity are combined. Know those in your neighborhood who are elderly, young, sick, or overweight. They are more likely to become victims of excessive heat and may need help. Stay hydrated by drinking plenty of fluids, even if you do not feel thirsty. Avoid drinks with caffeine or alcohol. Eat small meals and eat more often. Wear loose-fitting, lightweight, light-colored clothing. Avoid dark colors because they absorb the sun's rays. Use a buddy system when working in excessive heat and take frequent breaks if you must work outdoors. Because there's a potential to be ex exposed to heat in our workplace, we're going to talk about recognizing specific hazards related to heat stress. Although illness from exposure to heat is preventable, every year thousands become sick from occupational heat exposure, in some cases are fatal. 
Hazardous heat exposure can occur indoors or outdoors and can occur during any season if the conditions are right, not only during heat waves. During this presentation, I will be discussing heat related illnesses and methods to prevent or minimize the effects at the early stages of heat illness. Most outdoor fatalities, 50 to 70% occur in the first few days of working in a warm or hot environment because the body needs to build a tolerance to the heat gradually over time. The process of building tolerance is called heat acclimatization. Lack of acclimatization represents a major risk factor for fatal outcomes. We need to acclimate to hot environments. This is where the current pandemic plays a role. There's a greater potential for workers who have worked from home and then come back to a hot workplace without properly acclimating. Occupational risk factors for heat illness include heavy physical activity, warm or hot environmental conditions, lack of acclimatization, and wearing clothing that holds in body heat. Heat related illnesses occur when our bodies are overheated and our internal cooling system cannot cool us down fast enough or properly. When our bodies fail to cool us down in intense heat, the effects can be a serious illness and even death. This, is internal, this internal cooling system is called homeostasis. During homeostasis, the body burns calories and produces heat to maintain a temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Two effective ways that the body rids itself of heat are, one, sweating, which is where the body cools itself by sweat evaporating from the skin, and two, convective body cooling. The circulatory system carries core heat toward the skin surface and the body heat is carried away as the cooler outside air passes over the skin. There are warning signs of heat set stress. Problems develop when the body's cooling mechanisms are not able to work properly, such as when the air temperature exceeds body temperature and the body cannot easily cool itself, or when the air is humid and sweat doesn't evaporate quickly. Finally, remember that sweat doesn't evaporate easily from a person who works hard while wrapped in heavy clothing or protective gear. Heat-related illness is a concern in any weather, any time. <clears throat> Let's take a quick poll. What is the most dangerous type of heat-related illness? Okay, yes, heat stroke is the most dangerous. Let's take a look at all of them. The four heat related conditions <clears throat> we're going to discuss are <clears throat> heat rash, heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. The conditions are listed by severity with heat stroke being the most dangerous. Heat rash is a skin irritation caused by excessive sweating during hot and humid weather. Symptoms include clusters of red bumps on skin, which often appears on the neck, upper chest, and skin folds. Workers experience heat rash seek a, should seek a cooler, less humid work environment if possible. They should keep the rash area dry and apply powder to increase comfort. Keep in mind that creams should not be used to treat heat rash. Heat cramps are muscular pains and spasm they usually occur in the legs or abdomen. Heat cramps are often an early sign that the body is having trouble with the heat. Get the person to a cooler place and have him or her rest in a comfortable position. Lightly stretch the affected muscle and gently massage the area. Give an electrolyte containing fluid, such as a commercial sports drink, fruit, ju fruit juice, or milk. Water may also be given. Heat exhaustion is a more severe condition than heat cramps. Heat exhaustion often affects athletes, firefighters, construction workers, and factory workers. It also affects those wearing heavy clothing in a hot, humid environment. Signs of heat exhaustion include cool, moist, pale, ashen, or flushed skin, headache, nausea, dizziness, weakness, and exhaustion. If you suspect a person is suffering from heat exhaustion, move the person to a cooler environment with circulating air. Remove or loosen as much clothing as possible and apply cool, wet cloths or towels to the skin. Fanning or spraying the person with water can also help. 
If the person is conscious, give small amounts of cool fluids such as com a commercial sports drink or fruit juice to restore fluids and electrolytes. Milk or water may also be given. Give about four ounces of fluid every 15 minutes. If the person's condition does not improve or if he or she refuses water, has a change in consciousness or vomits, call 911 or your local emergency number immediately. Heat stroke is a life-threatening condition that usually occurs by ignoring the signals of heat exhaustion. Heat stroke develops when the body systems are overwhelmed by heat and can begin to stop functioning. Signs of heat stroke include extremely high body temperature, red skin, which may be dry or moist, changes in consciousness, rapid weak pulse, rapid shallow breathing, confusion, vomiting, and seizures. Heat stroke is life-threatening. Call 911 or your local emergency number immediately. If you can help start to rapidly cool the body by immersing the person up to the neck in cold water or douse or spray the person with cold water. Sponge the person with ice water doused towels over the entire body, frequently rotating the cold, wet towels. Cover the person with bags of ice. If you are not able to measure and monitor the person's temperature, apply rapidly apply rapid cooling methods for 20 minutes or until the person's condition improves. Let's examine the difference between the two most important heat conditions. The infected individual with heat exhaustion will feel faint or dizzy, while with heat stroke, the individual will have a throbbing headache. Heat exhaustion, the, the individual will have excessive sweating, while the heat with heat stroke will have no sweating. Heat exhaustion will have cool, clammy skin, and heat stroke will have red, hot, and dry skin. Both conditions will have nausea or vomiting. Heat exhaustion will have a rapid, weak pulse, while heat stroke will have a rapid, strong pulse. Heat exhaustion will produce muscle cramps, while heat stroke produce a loss of consciousness. Using the hierarchy of controls, we will look at all five of these to eliminate or reduce the effects of heat on workers. Some of these categories intertwine, but they help produce a plan to help your employees stay safe. Elimination. Eliminating heat by avoiding it is the safest possible way. Installing air conditioning in your work area is another way to eliminate the heat to protect your employees. Substitution is a second control. Unfortunately, there's not much we can do for substituting for heat related illnesses. Engineering controls. The third control is engineering. Engineering controls can, incru can include increasing your air velocity through ventilation controls, the use of reflective or heat absorbing shielding or barriers, reducing steam leaks, wet floors or humidity, use an air conditioning system in the rest areas, and install cooling fans, misting fans, or misting tents in your work area. The fourth would be administrative controls. <clears throat> Employers should ensure that workers are acclimatized before they work in a hot environment. Gradually increase workers' time in hot conditions over seven to 14 days. For example, a new worker schedule should be no more than 20% of the usual duration of work in the heat on day one and no more than a 20% increase on each additional day. For workers with previous experience, the schedule should be no more than 50% of the usual duration of work in the heat on day one, 60% on day two, 80 on day three, and 100% on day four. Closely supervise new employees for the first 14 days or until they are fully acclimatized. Some other administrative controls can be schedule your work earlier or later in the day, use wor work rest schedules, limit strenuous work such as carrying heavy loads, and use relief workers when needed. Employers should provide the means for appropriate hydration of workers. Water should be potable less than 59 degrees Fahrenheit and made accessible near the work area. Estimate how much water will be needed and decide who will obtain and check on water supplies. Individual, not communal drinking cups should be provided. Encourage workers to hydrate themselves. If in the heat greater than two hours and involved in moderate work activities, drink one cup or eight ounces of water every 15 to 20 minutes. During prolonged sweating lasting several hours, drink sports drinks containing balanced electrolytes. Avoid drinks with high caffeine or sugar, 
Generally, fluid intake should not exceed six cups per hour. And developing a heat program will be discussed later. The fifth and last control is PPE or personal protective equipment. A list of products are on the market to help your employees combat the effects of heat on the body. Multiple styles of cooling vests, cooling hats, cooling towels, and wide brim hats can be purchased. Dark clothing absorbs the heat. So remember to try to eliminate bulky, heavy, and dark PPE. Remember that PPE is the last line of defense using the hierarchy of controls. Let's take another poll. What is the most effective defense against heat-related illness? Yes, elimination is the right answer. However, using many levels in a hierarchy of control may be necessary. Combining administrative, engineering, and PPE controls are a good way to battle the heat if you can't eliminate it. This heat index app from OSHA is a great tool for anyone to use. The app is free and can be used at any location. By clicking on the risk levels, it will give you recommendations to stay safe. As the risk levels increase, so do the precautions. This is the, the example for lower risk conditions. These tips can be used as a reminder to keep your employees protected. During lower risk conditions, most people can work safely. Drink water and sports drinks for electrolyte balance, provide sh shade and hats and encourage their use. Again, this app is called Heat Index. Let's take our last poll question. While 60% of you marked no, 40% had marked yes, which is very good. Um, developing a heat stress program for your business is a great way to, uh, to help your employees stay safe. First, identify conditions in your work environment that expose employees to heat. Plan for conditions and temperatures that will affect your workers. Use the heat index app or similar technology to help identify the higher risk days. Identify hot areas in your work environment, measure heat levels around machinery, enclosed areas, places where welding equipment, torches are being used, and where ventilation is stagnated. Protect your workers by using the hierarchy of controls as we discussed earlier. Train your workers on the importance of monitoring heat related illnesses in the workplace. And most importantly, remember to acclimate your workers before exposing them to a hot environment. Thank you for participating, and I hope you picked up some useful information for yourself and your employees. Is there any questions? Yeah, so yeah, if you have any questions, be sure and uh, just put those in the, the comments. And we did get a couple here. Uh, let me start with, uh, what do you suggest we can do to eliminate heat in our work area? Uh, to work to eliminate heat in the work area, you know, if you could use air conditioning, of course, if it's feasible. Um, but if not, you know, there's many parts of the hierarchy of controls that you can use to help reduce exposures, you know, such as uh, engineering controls, administrative controls, PPE. Um, I think the most important thing is, is to acclimate your employees in that environment. Sure. Um, where can we get a heat stress program? A heat stress program, uh, John Frazier and I 
uh, we can develop anything that you would need for your business. Um, we could come out and take the measurements and, you know, observe your work areas and put together a plan for anybody that really would need it. Yeah, yeah, we, we were talking about this earlier. You know, a lot of the, the webinars we've done in the past are talking about disaster preparedness and things like that. And, and it, it wouldn't be uncommon to have a flood plan and, and a flood isn't gonna happen every year, but a lot of people don't have a heat plan in place and, and that's gonna happen every year, right? It's gonna get hot. So uh, it's interesting that uh, one, of the, one of the more dangerous threats to our, our business is one that we ignore sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Um, one of our colleagues, Mark Henline, uh, observed at a, a location, you know, where they couldn't eliminate the heat. Uh, management walked around with coolers filled with ice water and handed it out to the workers. And that was a, he said it was a very good um, program to show that management cared about the workers and, uh, you know, the interaction between the employees and management was, was very good. Sure, sure. So uh, thanks everybody for joining us and great job, Greg. That was great information, uh, good, good stuff. Uh, if you have any questions, you've got Greg's contact information there and, or anybody at the uh, WVU Industrial Extension would be happy to talk to you. And don't forget that uh, 10 hour OSHA uh, outreach training. Uh, if you've got more information, John Frazier is probably your best contact there, but uh, talk to any of us, we'll direct you to where you need to go. So, uh, Thanks again. And don't forget, we've got another webinar coming up real soon. So if you check out wvmep.com slash webinars, you can see everything that's coming up. So thanks for joining us and we'll see you again real soon.